Uh, good afternoon. It's um, a pleasure for me to be able to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Randy Jertle, who actually is going to be speaking to us about epigenetics on how genes and environment interact. Um, Dr. Jertle's um, background is he got his PhD on radiation bio biology at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and from there went into the Department of Radiology at, du at Duke University, where he spent and he is uh, spending his, um, all of his professional career. The, there are many contributions that Dr. Gertel has done to the scientific field and specifically to epigenetics. But since we have him here, I, it is not for me to actually describe them. But there are two of them that were certainly highly salient in my brain that had actually led me to shift the way that I think about things and the way that um, within our institute at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, we uh, help guide science. And that was the paper where he first demonstrated that in pregnant, in pregnant rats, you can actually, in pregnant mouse, you can actually um, change the, um, the likelihood of obtaining the agouti obese uh, animals on the basis of uh, the nutrients that the mothers were given during the pregnancy. So the notion that you could have a mutation on a mother that would be transferred to the newborn could be manipulated by an environmental intervention uh, that in this case was providing the methyl donor so that the gene could be methylated could actually protect uh, those animals from developing the phenotype uh, to me was transforming because it actually illustrates the concept that I was always being faced towards, which was the deterministic aspect of what our genes are. So you are born with your genes. If it makes you vulnerable, then um, that uh, shifts the paradigm about how do you address prevention of diseases. And he clearly illustrated an example on how even when you have the genetic mutation by environmental intervention, you can silence the expression of that mutation. And I think that that was very, very transformative and, and crucial in tipping, I think, making the tipping point in the whole areas of epigenetic science. Another uh, very seminal contribution that also got hardwired immediately into my brain was the concept of imprinting. And uh, we, each one of us has two genes. And, uh, and it was recognized that some of those genes, uh, was believed as a relatively small number, got imprinted early on. So one of them would be silenced and the other one would be expressed. And in a seminal paper, Dr. Giltel demonstrated that uh, using a very clever algorithm for extracting probability of imprinting, he demonstrated that the number of genes that were imprinted, in fact, was much greater than had initially been believed. And by developing this method, provided a tool for scientists to investigate and to better understand the mechanism by which imprinting happens. And that, again, has just exploded in the field. So it's a big pleasure for me to introduce Dr. R. Gertel. And again, thanks very much for uh, willing to come to us at NIH and, and present your work. Well, I want to thank Dr. Volkoff for that wonderful inter introduction. I also want to thank all of the people that were involved in choosing the speakers uh, for the Walls Lecture this year, and, and actually included me as one of them, uh, which is a real, real uh, honor. And <clears throat> finally, I want to thank the audience. I know how difficult it was for me, for example, this morning to get into NIH. So. <laughs> I won't go into it, <laughs> but it was an eye-opener. And I, it, I appreciate all of you being here, and I also appreciate all of the people that are listening and watching the webcast right now. I know that it takes time out of a busy schedule to do this, and it sure wouldn't be very interesting to give a talk when nobody is there. So I appreciate the audience uh, very, very much. Now. <clears throat> I chose this title for a lot of reasons. One is it's relatively vague, so I can talk about just about anything I want. But the second thing is that it includes the word environment. 
And I really like this word because the word environment really means different things depending upon the environment that the person actually is in that's thinking about it. So for example, if you're a nutritionist, I mean it conjures up, the word environment conjures up basically a food pyramid. Whereas if you're a toxicologist, <clears throat> what you think about probably is going to be a toxic waste site. That's the environment. Whereas if you're a psychologist or psychiatrist, the word environment would be the nurturing environment of the family, the, the surroundings, etc. And what we now know very clearly is that all of these environments ultimately impinge upon the genome through the epigenome. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today. The phenomena of the epigenome and its importance in disease susceptibility. Now, <clears throat> I attend a lot of meetings. And at one meeting, as we were breaking, one of my colleagues picked up a vial and he showed it to us as we were leaving. And he said, this vial contains DNA and it's been sitting in front of us for the past two days, and it hasn't done a damn thing. So, Just like a computer, basically our genome is impotent without the software telling it when, where, and how to work. So I, in my limited way of thinking about things, because I got my degree in nuclear engineering and computer science, so it's much more rigid maybe in thought, I think of the cell is basically being a programmable computer. So this is why you can have one genome, half from the mom, half from the dad, but still have 250 to 300 different cell types all doing different things in our body. Without that programmable system, we would basically have to change the hardware every time we had a different cell. And so today I'm going to be talking about the epigenetics effects of how genes and the environment interact. Now I've been in the field of epigenetics for about 20 years. And I would like to think that we are in the era of epigenetics, but it's clear to me that we still are really in the era of genomics. And we hear that the most important question right now is that why do individuals vary in their susceptibility to diseases? And a lot of time, money, and effort has been put into first finding single nucleotide polymorphisms or mutations, for example, that are altered first in, in exons, then introns, then promoter regions, and out, out in Never Never Land. Now, this has been successful, particularly, I think, in the field of cancer, but it has not been as successful in the field of neurobiology. And to me, a much more fundamentally interesting question is why do monozygotic twins, identical twins, also vary in their susceptibility to diseases if the only thing important in this process is genetic variation? One of the reasons for that is even though they have the same genome, basically, they more than likely do not have the same epigenome. And you can ask, well, how can you have a different epigenome in programming if they're in the same womb? It's possible, just as an example, that you could have different blood flows to these two identical uh, developing embryos. And that environment now is showed by the different colors, the washing that we have in this painting which is by Colin Murphy. And <clears throat> we actually had this commission for this environmental epigenomics meeting that Fred Tyson and I uh, put on in 2005. And slight variations in blood flow can change for example, nutrition. Or it could, ex it could change the, the toxicants that are ex those individuals are also exposed to. And as we'll show later, very small changes in nutrition, at least in animal models, can have profound effects on the development and disease susceptibility. Now, I like the history. And one thing I want to go over briefly is the history of epigenetic research. And this is from my perspective now. I got into this field in the early 90s. And what I have here is plotted publications, total publications, as a function of time, year, <clears throat> and on a linear uh, graph. 
So what I did for this is I wanted to show that basically up until around the year 2000, there's an inflection point right around 2005, right in here, where it looks like basically nothing really is happening much in the field of epigenetics to the point where it's actually going vertical and a lot is happening in the field of epigenetics. Now if you plot this rather than on linear paper, semi-log paper, what you will find is that what I'm showing is an exponential growth curve for publications in the field of epigenetics. And that in the scientific community, there's a doubling of the epigenetics papers every one and a half to two years. Last year alone, we put into publication somewhere between 15 and 20,000 papers, which took us 15 years from 1990 to 2005. Now this has resulted in some of the, what I would call more enlightened scientists to make these following comments. Oh, that's me. Epigenetics is now the hottest thing in bioscience. As Nora has pointed out, I've basically done work in epigenetics in two areas. One is in genomic imprinting, particularly evolution of this phenomena. Imprinted genes are monoallelically expressed. The silence allele is silenced epigenetically. And since there's only one copy of these genes that's functional, you do not need two hits to knock out the function. You only need a single hit. And that single hit can be both mutational or epigenetic. And depending upon the gene, can either increase or totally eliminate the function of these genes. Ladies and gentlemen, these monoallelically expressed genes are all disease susceptibility loci. And we are not going to understand diseases until we have defined the repertoire of these genes that we have in humans. Because they vary greatly between species, it's important that we work in the species that we're interested from the standpoint of disease susceptibility, which is the human. The other area that I work in and have done a lot, and this is what I'll be talking about basically most of the time now, is the fetal origins of adult disease susceptibility. So there's a lot of evidence, both in animal models and also in humans, that disease susceptibility doesn't just happen in adulthood, but much of it occurs very early in development, maybe often very early to the point where we're talking really at right after fertilization. And the two gold standards that I'm going to be talking about in humans that suggest this, these are situations that I call them natural experiments. You would never want to be in because they're horrific. But they occurred, and we now have people that went through this, and they're being used as to show and determine the fetal origins of adult disease susceptibility. And one is the Dutch famine, which occurred at the end of World War II, when the Nazis put an embargo on Holland. During that period of time, there was a severe restriction. It was a very, very cold winter and a severe restriction in nutrients. And 16,000 approximately or more people died. Now, some people were in utero during this period of time. And they later found, as they followed these people, that first of all, they were, when they were born, they were often of short stature and low birth weight. But later on in adulthood, they found out that they had, first of all, they showed increased incidence of cardiovascular disease, then obesity, then diabetes, and interestingly, a doubling or tripling of the incidence of schizophrenia. Now, another one of these natural experiments occurred, unfortunately, in the late 50s and early 60s in China. In this situation, 20 to 40 million people died. And basically, when following these individuals that were in utero during that period of time, they also, we've also shown basically the same type of scenario, again with a doubling or tripling of the incidence of schizophrenia. So severe lack of food or nutrition, maternal nutrition, particularly during the first trimester of development, results in a significant increase in psychosis. But up until just recently, the state of the art of this field, I think, is very nicely shown by one of my favorite cartoons by Sidney Harris, which is then a miracle occurred. So we know that back here there was, a, let's say, a shortage of food, nutrition. Out here, there's a significant, in time, there's a significant increase in the disease susceptibility. 
But what's the glue, the gravity, the memory system that holds those two disparate time points together was not known up until just recently, at least in animal models. And that miracle involves epigenetic modifications. This paper that we published in 2003, which Dr. Volkov has already talked about to some degree, was transformational, not only for the fetal origins of adult disease susceptibility, but actually also for the field of epigenetics. Because it was very clear, initially slowly, and it's gaining momentum now, that <clears throat> there, the large tent of epigenetics basically can encompass and affect all of biological research. So one of the reasons why you get this exponential, continual exponential rise in publications is not because of people of my age are exponentially doing more and more research, but it's because we have more and more people coming into the field of epigenetics doing research. So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics, like epicenter, just means above, in this case, genetics. And epigenetics research refers to the study of heritable changes in gene function that occur without a change in the sequence of the DNA. And the two main components of this epigenetic change or code are uh, cytosine methylations when they're 5' prime of guanine, and also DNA is wrapped around these nucleosomes, which are comprised of histones, and there are myriads of marks on these histone tails that either cause the chromatin to be condensed or loose. So in concert with the DNA methylation, the chromatin is either condensed and non-functional or open and functional. And this is basically the chemical programming that occurs on a cell basis that allows a liver cell to be a liver cell and a brain cell to be a brain cell. I'm now going to talk about the work that we've done with these agouti mice. And these it contains what is called a metastable epiallele, and I'll get into this later on. <clears throat> I call these the Agouti sisters. These animals are genetically identical because they're inbred. The only difference between this mouse and this mouse is what the mother was fed while they were in utero. In this case, the mother ate normal mouse chow. In this case, the mother ate normal mouse chow that was supplemented with methyl donors, like vitamin B12, choline, betaine folic acid. If you look at these two animals, they're, genetic, they're genetically identical, they're age matched, and they're both female, and don't at least appreciate the importance of epigenetics and disease susceptibility. I hate to say it, but there really isn't any hope for you. There isn't a better visual model to demonstrate this. I'm going to go a little more into this now because it's very important. We use this, I almost think of this as being, it's a biosensor, a coat color biosensor that's comparable to these liquid crystals when you put your hand on and they just change color. In effect, we have that now, that system, and we can look at any kind of environmental exposure and ask the simple question about whether it alters the epigenome. And we can see it not only in coat color, which you can see here, but you can also see it at the level of DNA methylation. So for example, normal follicle, hair follicle development occurs and it grows, and right at the end of the hair follicle development, you have the agouti gene is turned on and you put a little band of yellow at the base of a black hair shaft. And as a consequence, we now see that mouse as brown or agouti rather than black. For those of you that work with C57 mice, which are black, the reason for this is the agouti gene is mutated. But if this region in this strain of mice, this AVY locus, or these viable yellow agouti mice, a transposable element jumped in upstream of this agouti gene and set up an ectopic start site for transcription of the agouti gene. So in, when this region is completely unmethylated, the agouti gene is turned on inappropriately in all cells of the body, including the brain, but also in the hair follicles, and as a consequence, you get these completely blonde mice. Whereas if this region is totally methylated early on, you go back to normal regulation of the agouti gene, and you get what are called pseudo-agouti brown mice. If the decision, and I mean a decision, 
stochastic decision is made later on after there's some cell division, then you're going to start seeing this modeling appearance where one cell has been is hypomethylated and the other cell is hypermethylated. So it looks like almost like a calico cat. So you've got this variation in coat color totally dependent upon the degree of methylation at this IAP. So Rob Waterland, when he was in the laboratory, he's now down at Baylor. As a, he was as a postdoc at this time in my lab did a very, very important experiment, and that is here you have the mother eating controlled chow, normal mouse chow, and you can see the majority of the animals are yellow or nearly yellow, and about 20 to 30 percent of them are brown or heavily mottled. Whereas when you supplement the mother's diet with methyl donors, all these methyl groups that come down into the, and are placed on cytosine, for example, that I showed a few slides back, come in from your diet. So diet is incredibly important in this whole process and maintaining good nutrition during the development of these offspring is incredibly important in having proper development. So in this situation when you supplement the diet with these methyl donors you can see clearly that the distribution of offspring's coat color has been shifted towards brown and you have many fewer now that are over in the yellow or nearly yellow. You've taken this sort of normal distribution and you shoved it over towards the brown. Because these brown animals no longer become obese, and these obese animals also get diabetes and cancer, by supplementing the mother's diet with these methyl donors, you've significantly altered, in this case, reduced the incidences of these chronic diseases. Why these animals become obese is because they inappropriately express the agouti gene in the satiation center of the brain. It binds to the melanocortin-4 receptor, and these animals never know they're full, so they literally eat themselves into obesity, diabetes, and cancer. You would have never a priori predicted that a coat color gene would be involved in obesity but in this, and diabetes and cancer, but in this mouse strain, that is the case. That was important, very exciting, but this was the, the part of the study that was the most important, and that is that this change in coat color was shown to be basically completely dependent upon the degree of methylation at this cryptic start site in the control of the agouti gene. So in the control diet, when mothers are eating just normal chow, these are CPG sites in this region here. You see, these are the number of percent of cells that are methylated. You can see that normally you have the vast majority of the cells or the animals, these are all the offspring, it's about 100, have very low levels of methylation, which correlates with the fact that the vast majority of the animals are yellow or nearly yellow when their mothers ate controlled diet. Whereas when you supplement the diet with methyl donors, I think even the untrained eye and without even statistics, you can see that you have greatly increased the average methylation and that is very highly correlated and associated with the fact that now most of the offspring, the majority of them are brown or nearly brown. So simply changing the mother's diet early in development altered disease susceptibility in adulthood, not through mutations, but through altering the epigenome. So we often ask the question, people ask, what's more important, nature or nurture? I think this study very clearly shows in this situation we really are getting nature via nurture. Now, I want to go through this, this sort of more graphical, so if you think about the agouti coat color distribution, the study that I just showed, it's more, sort of a normal distribution, few totally brown, few totally yellow, with the most having some degree of modeling. If you supplement the mother's diet with methyl donors, like Dr. Waterland did, you shift this coat color distribution so that you have many more brown offspring. Dana Dolanoy, who is now at the University of Michigan as a graduate student in my lab, also showed that the phytoestrogenic compound present in soya at levels that are present in Asian diets also is capable and does shift this coat color distribution towards brown. What's interesting about this is genistein does not donate a methyl group. So there are compounds 
that are also going to alter this epigenetic response that are not methyl donors themselves. The mechanism by how this occurs, in other words, what's the signal transduction pathway for this is presently unknown, but it's very important to ultimately determine it. Then Dr. Dolanoy did another very important study. It's the first one done with this system that looked at a, what would you call it, environmental toxicant, an endocrine disrupting agent called bisphenol A, which is used to make hard clear plastics. Um, in the old days, I'm not sure as much now, but those big blue plastic containers where you had water in them, were made, they were made from bisphenol A. In this situation, she clearly showed that bisphenol A at levels in mice that we are exposed to and present also in our plasmas, that you get a significant increase in the incidence of yellow mice. Now, in this model system, this is not good. This is due to hypomethylation. And as you remember, these animals have higher incidence of obesity, diabetes, and cancer. Now, if you look at these two distributions, as I said, it doesn't take a rocket scientist very long to think, would it be possible to negate the negative effect of this environmental toxicant by supplementing the mother's diet either with methyl donors or with genistine? And indeed, when Dana did this, she clearly showed that this negative effect could be eliminated by supplementation of the mother's donor diet with methyl donors or genistein. So what we have here now, and I think this is the most exciting part of this whole study, that the fields of toxicology and nutrition have been merged. They're joined at the hip. I think of them as basically being the other side of the same coin. But it also demonstrates that you can block some of these negative epigenetic effects with the very, nut very nutrition that we eat. This becomes very important, I think, because it potentially allows in the future for medicine to start going away from thinking about completely therapeutic approaches to life and potentially even starting to think more about preventing diseases. Now, as Hippocrates said two millennium ago, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food, I think this study right here clearly shows that at least in mice anyway, that negative effects of environmental toxicants that are involved, involve the epigenetic modifications can be mitigated by basically food additives and nutrition that indeed food is medicine. And I think this is going to be a huge area of research in the future. So we definitely know we are what we eat. And unfortunately, they put a donut <laughs> shop right across from uh, my lab, and I do know where they go. And I think maybe I'll stop there. But I hope after this very, very short introduction that you appreciate we might not only be what we eat, we might also be to some degree what our mother was exposed to while we were in utero. And since there is evidence from other investigators that these epigenetic marks are not always uh, totally eliminated when they're passed through the egg and the sperm, that there's, in other words, potential for transgenerational uh, inheritance of epigenetic events, that we might even be what our grandparents and great-grandparents were exposed to. I'm now going to end this uh, talk with some data that we've just really just have re gotten. It involves the radiation effects of the, on the epigenome. And this work was studied, I mean, supported by the DOE Low-Dose Radiation Research Program and a grant that we got, or an award we got from the O'Keefe Foundation. As I said, my background is in radiation biology and nuclear engineering. So the work that I'm describing now by Autumn Bernal who's the graduate student in my lab, who successfully defended her PhD thesis based on these, these studies that I'm going to show right now two weeks ago, is really quite exciting to me because what it's really done is it's brought the fields of radiation biology and the fields of epigenetics together. 
I shouldn't, I'm going to stop. Does anybody know what this is? This is audience participation. Huh? It's, it's what? It's a reactor core. And why is this blue light here? Victor, this is Shrinkov radiation because electrons are going faster than the speed of light in the media of water. I was a reactor operator when I was an undergraduate licensed by the, at that time, called the Atomic Energy Commission. I have seen this. It's the purest blue you'll ever see, and it's almost mesmerizing, sort of like looking at a fire in a fireplace. Huh? Yeah. So the environmental epigenetic studies that have been done thus far are not many. We've done this one I've described, this one I've described, and this one I've described. There's been one additional study with ethanol, and that study also showed that 10% ethanol in the drinking water resulted in the formation of hypermethylation in brown mice to a higher incidence. But, so this is protective from this standpoint, but also in this study they found also increased incidences of cranial uh, facial uh, developmental problems. So the important point of this is that hypermethylation at one locus might be advantageous, but at another locus it might not be. And the other thing that's interesting is in vitro culture, which has been shown at least in, in humans, there's evidence that in, vi in vitro um, fertilization results in increased incidences, things like beckwith wiedemann syndrome, et cetera, that you also see in this situation hypomethylation or increase in the yellow animals. Now, all of these studies were done with chemicals, and they're all done at single doses. The electromagnetic radiation spectrum goes all the way from high energy cosmic rays to very low energy radio waves. And the only photons, basically, that are called ionizing radiation are those up here in the high frequency and high energy, because each photon possesses enough energy to break a bond. So this type of radiation is a basically a double-edged sword for us. It's very advantageous from a diagnostic standpoint, therapeutic standpoint, etc. but it also is, was shown already in the 20s by Mueller that it causes mutations, and many people have shown that uh, since then. So genomic changes are induced, strand breaks, muta DNA mutations, etc., by ionizing radiation. But we wanted to look then at the effects of low-dose radiation on the epigenome. And the types of exposures that we have, if you were to look at people at the end of the 20 or beginning of the 20th century, you would probably, basically all you would have is exposure from natural sources. And you use sort of an absorbed dose type of a unit, it, we'd be, we would have been exposed to about 0.3 centigrade or 300 millirems using an older uh, uh, version of uh, dose uh, unit. But in the beginning of the 21st century, the level of radiation would have already doubled because of the use of diagnostic radiation and occupational radiation from working in reactors, etc. So now our, our total dose on the average would be somewhere around 500 to 600 millirems or 0.6 centigrade if you're looking at absorbed dose. So radiation-induced damage occurs primarily through two different mechanisms. There's the direct action and indirect action. So if radiation, the photon, comes in with enough energy now to knock out an electron or to directly interact with the DNA, you can have DNA damage that's direct, and this is a direct effect. But this is about 20% of DNA damage is caused via this mechanism. 80% is caused by what's called the indirect action, where this electron now doesn't interact directly with the DNA, but rather it interacts with a molecule of water creating hydrogen free radicals. And then these hydrogen free radicals diffuse over and cause the damage. 
So looking at the study now, that this is work that's now been submitted for publication, uh, low dose radiation exposure, again using the viable yellow agouti mice. This is the set of schematic of how this study was done. At four and a half days after time pregnancies, radiation was delivered. Uh, and then at basically 21 days, the animals were born, and then tissues were collected out here at 43 days. And at that point, you could determine whether the animals were yellow, brown, or mottled. And you would get this type of a distribution, basically, again, of the coat color distributions when you're not exposed to anything. But if you look at exposure now to radiation, here we've got radiation doses going from zero up to 7.6 centigrade. To put this in perspective, mammograms would be down here. Natural background radiation, remember this is a single dose, but over a year would be somewhere in here. A CT scan would be somewhere around one to two centigrade in here. And the first evidence, basically, of radiation causing cancer is going to be in the tens of centigrade, so it's out here. So when Autumn did these studies, the first thing she looked at was coat color, and clearly what she saw was a significant drop in the number of animals that are yellow. These are offspring now. So this curve, this is disappearing. Concomitant with that is a significant increase in the number of brown mice to the point that when you're at one and a half to 1.4, or somewhere between one and three centigrade, you have 14 times as many brown mice as you have yellow mice. This is in response to very low doses of ionizing radiation. And in fact, at 7.6, there's actually no yellow mice, and brown mice, they can't even determine the ratio because it's, it's infinite. But it's an interesting at this point, I don't show the data, but you're starting to see this distribution go back. The reason this has dropped is you're now seeing a significant increase in the amount of model animals. So what's happening is the distribution is being shifted over to brown during low doses up to around three centigrade, and then it looks like it's starting to come back. We couldn't go to higher doses because the lethality of the system, you do not have any offspring but there was no selection of offspring, sex, et cetera, at this point. If you look at met methylation, this again is highly correlated to the, the formation of the brown animals, which are hypermethylated. So low doses of ionizing radiation during early gestation increase the incidence of brown AVY offspring in a sex and dose dependent manner. I forgot to say that this is in male mice Female mice, there's no effect at all of radiation over these doses. And this is associated with an increase in DNA methylation at the agouti locus. Since brown AVA mice have a reduced incidence of obesity, diabetes, and cancer when compared to that in yellow animals, this means that low doses of radiation induce a positive adaptive response through alterations in the epigenome. Now, as I said, 80% of DNA damage is through the generation of free radicals, oxygen free radicals. So the postulate was then that maybe antioxidant supplementation would be able to reduce this effect that we were seeing of low doses of ionizing radiation. So here you've got the yellow and brown mice at a ratio of about one, and when they're either sham irradiated, sham irradiated or no irradiation at all, sham irradiation doesn't cause any effect. Then if you expose the animals to three centigrade, you get about 14 times as many brown animals as you have yellow animals. And then when you have three gray or three uh, centigrade, and you add antioxidants to the mother's diet, you completely mitigate this effect that you have of ionizing radiation itself. If you look at DNA methylation, again you see here at zero dose, sham or uh, unirradiated, uh, have basically the same, and this is a percent methylation. You add three centigrade of radiation, you significantly increase the amount of methylation in line with the fact that there's many more brown animals 
in the offspring population. Then if you add three gray plus antioxidants, you bring the degree of methylation back down to normal, which is what you would expect given that the number of animals that are brown and yellow are basically identical and the same as what you see in unirradiated situation. So maternal antioxidant supplementation mitigates the increase in DNA methylation and the incidence of brown ABY offspring caused by low dose ionizing radiation exposure during early gestation. Our findings provide evidence also that the positive adaptive, the positive adaptive epigenetic response induced by low doses of radiation is mediated in part through oxidative stress. I must tell you these results were unexpected when we first started, but they're true. I want to end this talk now with a little talk about risk assessment. Radiation was discovered by Rankin in 1895, and in 1896 he took this x-ray of his wife's hand. It wasn't long thereafter that x-rays were used basically to set bones that were broken, etc. But the early radiologists used to tune up their units using their own hands. And as you could imagine, after a number of tunings, they ran into problems with necrosis, ultimately not only necrosis but cancer. So the biological effects, the negative ones, of high doses of radiation were very apparent. But when we look at low doses of radiation and look at epigenetic effects, what this is basically AVY hypomethylation, or if you want to think about it, is yellow mice going this way. We have increased numbers of brown mice and decreases in hypomethylation or increases in hypermethylation. So what you have is a curve that goes like this. And we think, you know, only guesstimating, because at 7.6 centigrade, it looks like it's going back. This curve is crossing zero, zero, somewhere at 10 centigrade or above, somewhere in here, and then goes up into the higher doses where other investigators have uniformly seen hypomethylation and also a sex effect that it's more prevalent in males than in females. This sort of biphasic dose response curve or hockey shaped dose response curve is consistent with a hormetic dose response curve, but it is not consistent with the linear no, linear no threshold model, which says that every dose of radiation is problematic. This is surely not the case when you're looking at epigenetic changes. So questions in future studies. These are my sort of biases and things that I think are going to be important to do in the future. One question is, does low-dose radiation exposure alter the human epigenome? Remember, all of this is done in mice, and we've only looked at one metastable epi allele. Another big question, if yes, are the changes in the epigenome <clears throat> inherited transgenerationally? This is a big, big issue, big question. So how do you do this? I believe that the best population, human populations for addressing these critically important questions are gonna be the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bomb survivors and their offspring. These are available, and I think we need to think seriously about looking at them from the standpoint of epigenetic modifications. I now want to end it, this is the last slide, with a slide that I call food for thought, something that you'll be able to chew on and think about after you leave this lecture. One of them is a quote by a physicist and the other by a philosopher. The physicist is John Cameron at the University of Wisconsin who developed the first solid state lithium fluoride radiation detective system and also started the very first radiation health physics department at the UW. And later, at the, towards, later towards the end of his life, he wrote this, I am now almost certain that we need more radiation 
for better health. And the second quote, what does not kill me makes me stronger. Thank you. Any questions? Well, you covered a lot of grounds. So you made some of the points from some of the studies from the famine and also your mouse model. So is the process you are suggesting is reversible in mid-phase after some mutations, like me, say, or early stage of me? Could it be affected by some of the antioxidant effects? In other words, you're saying an adult animal that has, let's say, a negative effect, can you reverse that? Yes. In adult animals. That's an excellent question. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody's looked at it. We've always done work with the basically developing fetus and the programming there, but we've never actually addressed the question that you're talking about. And, and it's very important, and if anybody is interested in doing this, I wish somebody would, because when other people ask this question, I would be able to answer it. And the second question regarding the Hiroshima and the Nagasaki effect, that has probably one of the most studied population in terms of radiation exposure and the effect on all the issues related to cancer and other changes. So did anybody look at the degree of methylation of some of the genes in this category of uh, Japanese victims? Well, it's never been looked at epigenetically. The only thing that's been looked at are basically genetic mutations. And most of the exposures are quite high. They're in the tens of the hundreds of rads. 500 rad or centigrade is lethal if you get it in a whole body, just for those of you who don't know that. That's the sort of the edge that we're talking about. So these are down in probably the tens of rads to hundreds of centigrade. <clears throat> but there were about 6,000 children that were actually exposed in utero. My guess, though, I don't know this for a fact, that those exposures would probably be lower, otherwise they might not have made it through. And those would be interesting to look at from the standpoint of epigenetic modifications and particularly seeing whether there's any, if there is anything we can find that's able to be carried through from generation to generation. That's all I know. There's no other information known. This is the very first, to my knowledge, of epigenetic effects, even in the animal models, that's been done, done, done at this low of dose of radiation. Does the effect of radiation affect the gene which is used as a detector in your case? The what? The effect of radiation or other environmental effects you are suggesting affect the gene you are suggesting? You mean the gene? Yes. That I don't know. We didn't sequence that. It's unlikely, but it could happen. Thank you. It's a very wonderful talk. I've been interested in the whole schizophrenic attitude toward radiation that we've had uh, in Europe. People use radiation for health effects. Right. Uh, radiation baths are common. Yet here and in people America, that have high levels of radiation in their surrounding terrestrial environments tend to have lower incidences of cancer. There's a lot of, lot of data along these lines. Ask your question, and I can continue on. <laughs> so, so John Cameron thought that at some point, he thought that at this point we're ready for a placebo-controlled double-blind study of radiation for, in humans at low doses to look at positive health effects. But again, we're worried about the um, linear no-threshold theory, which says that at any dose, radiation is harmful to us. From a uh, clinical standpoint, what's it going to take for me as a physician to be able to get a, a protocol put forward where I can give a low dose radiation without, that I can give a low dose radiation and look for either effects on uh, neuroinflammation or um, yeah. cellular effects that we, would be beneficial in light of some of the um, um, regulatory problems. I think what it's going to do for one is that, as I said before, just because we're seeing these phenomena at the agouti locus, which is what we're seeing, there are positive adaptive effects. We don't always know whether hypermethylation is going to be positive at all metastable epiallial positions. That we don't know. We'll never know all, but we've only looked at one. 
And there's no doubt that the epigenomes in humans and mice, for example, are greatly different, which means that we don't have any clue what the epigenetically labile targets are going to be in humans. We need to identify them. I would put my effort initially on these regulatory elements for imprinted genes. Uh, they're good biosensors, uh, and they're also incredibly important. And we can determine whether or not these are altered in humans. As I say, that to do that, we'd have to actually look at some of these individuals that were exposed to, high, to higher doses of ionizing radiation or exposed in utero. Other than that, I don't know whether we still, people would still want to think about using ionizing radiation as a positive effector from the standpoint of health. As I said, I was, I did not predict this. I did not expect this, but it's what we see. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about the effects of these various uh, radiation or different things during pregnancy. And I was just wondering whether post-pregnancy treatments can reverse these effects <laughs> at all, or whether we're essentially doomed by what our parents did to us. This is what was asked before, and my answer still is nobody's really done this. Okay. Uh, these are very interesting studies to do, and I would hope, you know, there's a lot of young people out there, and there's a lot of people worldwide, you know, watching this webcast. These studies need to be done. Uh, I will not probably do them, but uh, somebody needs to. Uh, yeah, that, that Randy, thanks very much for a, a very interesting talk. And I'm very, I didn't realize you were starting to work on the effects of uh, radiation on the epigenetic marks. And because obviously it's a perfect field to use epigenetic technology to try to understand what the effects are of this radiation, just even from the molecular biology perspective. But the other thought that occurred to me as, as a nation and coming from Brookhaven National Laboratory where a lot of the the research on the effects of radiation occurred, and were actually there were scientists that were proposing that low doses of radiation may be beneficial mm -hmm. because they prime the machinery of the cell in order for it to be able to respond better if it is then exposed to a large insult. So my question comes around the concept of, in that period, and even when I was at Brookhaven, there was a lot of concern, of course, of the potential of contamination from radiation. What happened recently, well, relatively not so recently in Russia, but now in Japan very mm -hmm. recently, alert us that the notion of radiation exposure at high doses is a reality. And I'm not even considering the possibility of a terroristic uh, intervention that involves radiation, which is also very real. So in, in recognizing what you are doing right now is, um, how can we use the epigenetic tools to try to determine are there certain interventions that we can do to prevent that damage. So if you are going to or to intervene as soon as it happens, is there any information there? Is there any particular um, academic centers working on this type of questions? To my knowledge, there's nobody working on this right now. I think now once this gets out, there will be a lot more people working on it. Uh, the other thing is that historically, I want to make a comment to scientists in general because I have to admit I was guilty of this myself. Uh, I heard about this phenomenon of hormesis probably 20 years ago, and I thought, to use a nice terminology, it was BS. Uh, I don't think that anymore. And the rationale for it always was, well, there's no mechanism that will allow for this to occur. But no mechanism means it's really what you're saying is no known mechanism is a, a, that we know at that time. It appears that one mechanism that allows for this hormetic response to occur in, in, in individuals and in animals is epigenetic adaptations and stabilization of the epigenome in response to radiation and frankly probably a lot of different toxicants. Even if, I, I mean, this is, it hasn't been done, but I thought about this, we can block this positive effect now at this one locus by antioxidants. Could we also block the increase in brown animals we see when the mothers ate and took in methyl donors? So in other words, is there a common mechanism where all of these are going in, let's say, through the generation of free radicals and that's what the cell is actually sensing, and it's stabilizing its genome to allow for survival. 
I think this is what's going on. And I think now that there's a potential mechanism for this to occur, I would hope that we're going to see a lot more people studying this than studied it in the past. Hey, Randy, I had a quick question. Um, could you speculate on why you think you see the gender differences in response to low-dose <laughs> radiation? That I don't know, but as I said, other people have seen that also at high doses. Um, I don't know. I um, have two very um, intriguing observations from your talk that maybe you can shed light on uh, the doses of radiation as related to the um, antioxidant effect. And in low dose radiation, especially a three gray, you're probably inducing mostly single strand break and the, uh, your um, um, results with the antioxidants certainly support that. Now the higher doses of radiation, you probably would tend to induce more double-stranded break. Would you mm -hmm. care to hypothesize of that difference on epigenetics in terms of uh, double and stranded and single strand break? I'm not going to, but I can say that the field of DNA repair is intimately tied in with epigenetics because when you repair the DNA, you have to also repair its programming. So there is going to be epigenetics and changes in the epigenome. They have to be brought back to the same level that they had before, otherwise you truly have not repaired that area. So these fields are tied together, even though initially, I have to admit I didn't think of them as being tied together. And I would imagine as more people are looking at single and double strand breaks, they're gonna start looking at the histone marks that are in how they're repaired and also the methylation marks. This is stuff that will be done in the future. I will not do this, but somebody will, because it's important. Um, I was wondering in the goody mice who um, were treated with low doses of radiation, who you saw the-, the I can't hear you so well. Sorry. Um, the goody mice that you treated with low doses of radiation, who you, where you saw the reversal in yellow coat color, did you also see a decrease in the more severe health defects, so the diabetes, the obesity, and the cancer that occurred later on in life? You would see that because automatically the reason that you have these problems is because the agouti gene is inappropriately exposed in the brain. So it, it's an automatic situation that occurs in this animal system. I want to thank you again for a wonderful presentation. And before we end, I do want to tell everybody in the audience that you are all invited for the reception that is down there someplace very close by. And I will give you an opportunity. Where is it? The library. The library. And I will give you an opportunity to directly ask questions and, and, and network within one another. So thanks very much.